there was an article uh, in Bloomberg that was called Corporate Sanc Self-Sanctioning of Russia Has U.S. Fearing Economic Blowback. And the article read, Russia's invasion of Ukraine galvanized the U.S., U.K., and European Union to unleash a slew of sanctions meant to punish Vladimir Putin's government and pressure him to pull his forces back. But some Biden administration officials are now privately expressing concern that rather than dissuading the Kremlin as intended, the penalties are instead exacerbating inflation, worsening food insecurity, and punishing ordinary Russians more than Putin or his allies. So what's happening there? And who could have seen that coming, by the way? Yeah, I mean, only anybody who's paid attention to U.S. sanctions in Iran right. and North Korea, Venezuela. Um, yeah, right. nobody really. Nobody no one, could, yeah. Could have foreseen this. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think when you get into questions of sanctions efficacy, you have to ask why they were imposed in the first place. And there's always like the public reason and then, you know, the reasons that nobody wants to talk about publicly. The sanctions were imposed in response to the invasion and they were ca characterized as uh, retaliation for the invasion, meaning essentially, you know, we want to hurt the Russian economy so much that uh, Vladimir Putin has no choice but to turn around and pull his soldiers out. Nobody who's witnessed the way the United States has used sanctions and the effect that they've had uh, around the world over the last even 20 years. They're clearly sanctions uh, have never been effective on that short a time frame in changing the behavior of the target country. Um, now, if you take a much longer term approach here and suggest that, you know, maybe these sanctions were imposed not for the immediate reason or the immediate uh, cause of trying to get Russia to uh, rethink its its actions, but to isolate the Russian economy and cut it off and do what what has been done to Iran, again, North Korea, Venezuela, these other places, Syria increasingly, um, to do the same thing to Russia, then, you know, it starts to to make some sense. And that's that's really what uh, the Bloomberg piece is talking about. I mean, it's it's collective punishment. It's collective kind of uh, imposed imposed sanctions and then forget it. We just kind of go on our daily lives uh, while the people in the target target country suffer. Uh, but that's the point. The goal is, who knows, maybe just to, to leave these things in place in perpetuity. And maybe it's some kind of nebulous regime change, which, uh, again, has never happened. I mean, nobody could look at U.S. sanctions and say that that's a realistic goal. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, it's sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's I mean, it's disingenuous for the Biden administration or for people in the Biden administration to say, gosh, this isn't working the way we thought it was going to. Like, how did they think it was going to work? There's there's only uh, the one model to go on, really. What is the cost on other countries? Like, what is the, the fallout going to be of these sanctions on other countries? What's going to happen to everywhere from like Europe to Africa? Right. And so, I mean, we're already seeing some of the fallout of the war, which which is sort of the the invasion plus the uh, the sanctions and the effect that they've had that's had on um, food exports. Uh, you know, the Russians have stopped exporting uh, much of their food, although they, the, you know, they've made some exceptions, I think, for uh, Central Asia. Um, Ukraine has been unable to export food. And these are I mean, these are two breadbasket countries. They export a lot of grain. Uh, they export a lot of cooking oil. And so you're seeing um, you know, in countries that are food importers that tend to be food importers like Egypt, Sudan, um, you know, Lebanon. Uh, this has been a big, uh, big concern in Lebanon um, and, and elsewhere in Africa and, and parts of the Middle East, Yemen, for example. You know, this this is uh, really impacting humanitarian efforts there. Um, the 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 shortages of and, the you know, the, the consequent rise in price. Uh, of uh, basic commodities is is a huge blow for these places. Um, in terms of Europe, I mean, I think the big impact is is in terms of energy, um, and and that'll come uh, primarily in the form of natural gas. Now, Europe, the EU has already imposed um, a, an embargo on most of the Russian oil that it was importing. Uh, they'll have to figure out how to you know find new sources or uh, alternative energy uh, you know to replace that oil um, but Europe is far more dependent on Russia for natural gas and and we've seen just over the last week or two 
uh, the Russians cutting gas shipments to Europe uh, substantially. I mean, cutting off entire countries, cutting you know shipments to Germany by half or more, um, and and that's really going to hurt Europe as winter approaches. And and there have been uh, moves to you know try to. Uh, impose conservation measures to find alternative suppliers. Um, you know, the, the alternative energy, the kind of green alternative energy option is always, always seems to be last on the list because it's the most complicated and, and would require the most uh, infrastructure. Uh, God forbid investment. we save the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, God forbid you take this opportunity to do something good for the planet. Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's, that's going to be a big blow, uh, to Europe. And we haven't even seen, I think, the worst of that, which will come uh, if these gas supplies aren't somehow, um, you know, replaced by wintertime and people are trying to heat their homes and uh, being told, you know, sorry, we don't have uh, we don't have enough gas for that. 